Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. Welcome back. Uh, I'm here talking with Jay Richards, a uh, moral philosopher and economist, about his recent book, uh, Money, Greed and God. And we've been talking about socialism, capitalism, free enterprise, and uh, a lot of the mythology that it springs up around around uh, capitalism and uh, what what it is and what it isn't. And in his book, he talks about eight myths, and we've covered some of them. But I wanted to get to the Nirvana myth because that that sounds very seductive, <laughs> and I think the Nirvana myth would be, in my way of saying it, you know, we've got an economic system compared to what? Yeah, Bill, that's actually the question. Whenever someone says, well, is the a free enterprise a moral system? The question is, that, well, is it, is, it, is it moral and as good as, say, Nirvana or as the kingdom <laughs> of God or whatever the kind of uh, utopian idea that we can imagine is? The relevant question is, uh, how good is this system compared to the other ones that we have some capacity to realize, right? Mm -hmm. That's the real moral question. Of course, compared to the kingdom of God, every system looks terrible and decadent and depraved. But that's not the relevant question. We don't have the, the ability on our own to establish the kingdom of God. That's actually, that's God's job. But we do know from history that there's some different ways of arranging economies. There's command economies like they tried in the Soviet Union. There's complete basket cases where you don't even sort of have a, a functioning state and a rule of law. And you have generally free and open economies where you have limited government, private property rights, rule of law, and then a wide amount of economic freedom. And then, so that's what you want to compare. So socialism, fascism, uh, anarchy, and free enterprise. When you frame it that way, free mm -hmm. enterprise wins hands down. If you compare it to Nirvana or the kingdom of God or whatever, well, of course it's going to look bad, but what's your alternative? So when we hear about, well, we're going to free universal free health care, we're going to have free education, we're going to have free... I don't know. Why not food? Yeah. Well, why not? Uh, Absolutely. I mean, surely food and water are more important. Why don't we nationalize start with, start those? With that. Yeah, yeah. But the yeah. reality is that uh, <laughs> by declaring something a right or saying that it's going to free, that doesn't actually increase the supply. These are still scarce goods. So I always remind people when they're talking about free college. Well, do, are professors not going to get paid? Um, obviously, it's not free in itself. It's free at the point of service, which means, well, it will be free for the students that actually consume the education and will force someone else to pay for it. That's the kind of economic reality. You want to, the reality is if it's, something's a scarce good, you can't make it abundant and literally free simply by declaring it so. Well, and uh, I don't think you have it down as one of your myths. Mm -hmm. One of the things that strikes me is that in, in my background is in, in investing is that there are always trade-offs. Sure. There's going to be, if you want Absolutely. this good thing, there's going to be this bad thing. Yeah. And you never get both. You, you never know, get that's all, right. all or, good. Or you have lots of good things, but you can't have all of them. And so that ends up being a bad. In fact, this does relate to one of my myths called the piety myth, which is uh, confusing your good intentions for the actual consequences of policies. If you assume that you can have all outcomes, all sort of desirable outcomes, uh, that's easy. But the reality is we have a limited amount of time. We have a limited amount of resources. That's kind of the most basic principle of thinking economically is to think in terms of trade-offs, in terms of opportunity costs. And unfortunately, probably 95% of the people that engage in economic policy debates haven't even learned that first lesson. Well, and you don't get elected. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You don't get elected reminding people that there are these tough trade-offs. That's exactly right. But the incentives of politicians in a democratic society are different from the uh, you know, the, the realities of markets. Well, we talked in the, early, in the earlier segment about the issues of what happens as technology advances mm -hmm. and the nature of work changes and how people cope right. with that. Then you've written the book, The Human Advantage. And what is your outline for how people cope with change in a, in a rapidly changing technological world and, and social world? Well, my, my general uh, argument in the book is that we first want to know, okay, what's the new economy like, what we call the information economy? What, what are the kind of key features of it? Well, it's disruptive. It grows exponentially. Uh, it's hyper-connected. It's digital. And it's what I could say is it's ever more informational. And so then the question is, okay, well, so what do we need to do as human beings to adapt ourselves to that? And I argue that there are actually these five virtues that we need. So in a highly disruptive environment, you need to exercise courage. Courage is the willingness to act in the context of failure. If you don't try anything, 
uh, you're very unlikely to succeed. But failure itself uh, is not the pathway to success. You also need to be able to learn from failure, to improve from failure. Those are sort of the kinds of virtues that I argue we need to cultivate. So the argument's not everybody needs to get a master's degree in computer engineering. Rather, we need to emphasize those things that are uniquely human, that humans can do and that machines cannot. The basic idea is that whatever can be automated eventually will be automated, and that will leave all of the uniquely human assets for us to focus on. So, but you're talking about characteristics, the really virtues, characteristics that only individuals can develop. Yeah, or at least individuals primarily. And so, of course, a firm can also exercise courage. It can learn from its mistakes. But I think it helps to think first about individuals, because what virtue is, essentially, we act consciously and freely in a particular way to be punctual or to be kind, right? We, that eventually becomes a habit. But if we do it long enough, it actually works its way back into who we are. So we become more than we were at the beginning. So I actually think the sort of lesson of the high-tech economy is that we need to focus on those things, the best things about what it means to be human. Well, who in our, in our, in, in our education system or, or, is that being taught? Well, not very much, unfortunately. I mean, one of the, the key virtues I talk about is anti-fragility, which is just this ability to improve when you're perturbed or, or damaged or when you fail. But of course, if you look at the average college scene now, we're, we're making kids ever more fragile rather than training them and teaching them to be able to deal with difficult people and difficult ideas with which they disagree. We are training kids to be instantly uh, uh, angered and outraged by uh, in some particular slight. This is absolutely not a formula for success in the wider world. Well, one of the high school systems here in, in Maryland mm -hmm. uh, just abolished the valedictorian well, and, yeah. and, grade, and grade ranking <laughs> and because they felt that uh, the kids felt, I guess they were the prime movers here, they didn't want to be made to feel bad right. if they weren't number one. Yeah, and so I guess either everybody is number one or no one's number one. I mean, this is what you end up with, and there's very little to aspire to, unfortunately, in that kind of system. So the the book is the, who who's the who's the book aimed at? Is the book that is it aimed at people who want to improve themselves, or is it aimed at policymakers, or it's, how do we? It, mainly the former. I, I've thought of the the reader of this book as someone who's just decide trying to decide what they ought to do, a high school or a college student, or maybe somebody that's been displaced by a job. It's a sort of manual on how they can succeed in the new economy. There's some stuff about policy. I have a section at the end where I talk a lot about policy because I think that's important. But I do think uh, that the main lesson is these particular virtues that individuals need to cultivate. And so that's the really the primary audience for the book. And again, ticking off the list of virtues, mm -hmm. what do we need? Well, so uh, you need courage, okay. you need anti-fragility, okay. you need altruism, you need the ability to collaborate because we are in a hyper-connected economy, uh, and you need a virtue that I call creative freedom, which is the ability to constrain yourself so that you can create things of value. Because when you create things of value, like if you're a great musician, right, you become free to play Debussy or Rachmaninoff, not by just banging around on the piano, but by constraining yourself for years to learn how to play the piano in the same way in business. You acquire a kind of freedom to create value for people, but you do it by constraining yourself initially. So again, it's about discipline and virtue. So self-discipline, saying I'm going to choose to do this and not and do not that. Not that. Altruism is about thinking about the needs and the wants of other people. So you try to anticipate the sorts of things that people might want if you were able to produce it, and then you set about finding a way to produce it. And that's not in today's curriculum in most public schools. No, it's probably not in most public schools. I mean, I, I'll say just a shameless bit of, uh, of promotion that at the Bush School of Business at Catholic University, we... That's where you are. We, that's that's where I am. We plug virtue into every class because we think it's an essential part of what it means to do good how, business. How do you do that? Well, we don't just have a business ethics course. That's how most schools do it, right? Where you have so this you do business, business here and then you yeah, do and ethics, you do this ethics here. And it's some okay. kind of unique thing that business people uh, are supposed to do. But I mean, ethics is ethics. Don't kill people. Don't steal from people. Don't defraud them. People treat people kindly. That's, those are the universal kind of ethical rules. Yeah. And so that matters whether you're doing finance, it matters whether you're doing economic policy, it matters uh, if you're doing accounting, obviously. So we focus a lot on accounting ethics. I mean, the reality is we think it's not just that we ought to do business in a certain way. We actually think that when you do things the right way, you're much more like, likely to succeed in business itself. And do employers value that? 
Absolutely. Are you, are you, is Employers, your placement rate high? Absolutely. And, and I mean, the reality is, if you think about the high tech economy in California, I mean, these, these companies compete with each other for perks for their employees. Now, their employees are highly motivated, obviously, and work really hard. Uh, but there's also competition for, for skill. And so companies are constantly worried that they're going to lose their uh, most valued and, and best trained employees to someone else. That's something that it is important to remember. And so if you've got a if you've got a, a company that you're working for, a boss that treats you like an animal, uh, like a dog, you're not likely to stay there very long if you're a very skilled employee. No, <laughs> but I think that you know it's the business. Business. I think there's an undervaluing of the soft skills in business, mm. at least the way it's Absolutely. thought. Of. Maybe that's what you're yeah. describing, and that you know we have. In, in the in the in the conservative movement, for example, right. there are people who talk about economic uh, agendas, and then there are people who talk about social. I don't really think you can separate. I them. don't either. I don't think there's a vibrant uh, uh, market economy, vibrant you know economic growth, unless you have a, a solid base in uh, family and civil society and religion. Absolutely, and I mean, I think that's if anything, the last twenty or thirty years has taught us that that the state of the family, whether a small child has his parents around or not, that's the number one predictor of childhood poverty. So if you mm -hmm. thought, well, that was that's a social issue, well, the most it's also connected to the most important economic issue, which is childhood poverty. You need a vibrant culture in order to have the rule of law. Rule of law isn't just about what the government does. It's about what's written on the human heart. It's about these uh, culture and virtue forming institutions, churches, synagogues, families, those have really, really important economic implications. And I think we, honestly, I think the lesson of the last 50 years has taught us that. What are you working on now? Well, actually, it's a completely unrelated book, which I finished actually on fasting. And so I'm, I, uh, it comes out in January. In I noticed you're looking a little well, thin. Well, okay, so I hope I'm not, <laughs> not too thin. But, I, you know, I, I discovered fasting a few years ago, and turns okay. out there are thousands of scientific articles on the physical and health benefits of fasting. Uh, and I thought, yeah, as a Christian, um, this is something that, that Christians for hundreds of years did, and we've mostly let it fall by the wayside. And so I, I make the, both the spiritual and the physical case for renewing fasting as a part okay, of the basic lifestyle. Okay, I'm calling an audible. We're changing the subject of this show. <laughs> tell me, tell me about fasting. What is it? What is it that's good for you? Why? Uh, why? Why should? It's why a, should we want to do that? The, the reason we should want to do it is, I mean, there's a bunch of them, but but yeah. one is that if you think about the long course of human history. People didn't have access to Fruit Loops, right? We didn't have access to granola and sugar and simple I that carbs. Was a right. Everything, yeah, it's, it should be a right. But right. you know, th this is how we normally live our lives. Yeah. Every three or four hours, we get a little sugar boost. Essentially, this is the standard American diet. Uh, for most of human history, I mean, we're designed to eat sometimes, to feast sometimes, and then not to eat at other times. I mean, that's how the seasons varied, right? And so, I actually think. If you sort of look at it physiologically, we're actually designed to function this way, in which sometimes we eat a lot, sometimes we eat very little or not at all. And now we know that when you do this kind of fluctuation, you're much more likely to have low insulin levels, you're much more likely to have uh, healthy blood sugar. Uh, there is a physician that wrote the foreword in the book in Toronto who is reversing severe obesity and type 2 diabetes with fasting, not with medicine, but with fasting. And so this is this is all sort of new information. I mean, you might have suspected maybe there was a physical benefit to this stuff, but uh, for a long time, people just thought of fasting as a, as a spiritual discipline, something, you know, to sort of exercise discipline and self-sacrifice. Uh, but it turns out there's a lot of evidence that's actually good for you. By fasting, you mean not eating for a day, three days? Either one. So fasting strictly just means a period of time in which you don't eat. And so yeah. if you have a water-only fast, it might be 20 hours during the day, right? It's often called intermittent fasting. So you limit the amount of time during a 24-hour day to four or eight hours, and you eat all your calories then. And then you don't eat for the rest of the day, and of course, while you're sleeping. That actually has a very specific metabolic effect. It brings your insulin levels way down. It, it trains your body basically to use body fat for fuel rather than to use the sugar that's always floating around in your blood. So there's all these uh, somewhat intricate metabolic effects that, that take place uh, that are highly positive uh, if you actually practice this as part of a healthy lifestyle. So you re-release Money, Greed, and God. When you re-release the human advantage, there are going to be six now, not just five. The sixth is going to be fasting. <laughs> well, fasting, of course, is an exercise of personal discipline. And so I think I could subsume it under one of the one of the virtues. Well, the reason I enjoy these after shows is just sort of wandering around different topics. But it seems like you're really in the business of teaching virtue as much as anything. Yeah, and I mean, I'm really interested in this kind of inter intersection between 
different areas. So the mm -hmm. intersection between lifestyle and health and science, or the intersection between philosophy and morality and economics. That's, I mean, that's something that is fascinating because so often these are put in different buckets. But the truth of the matter is that almost everyone that goes in to study economics is usually interested in it initially because they have some moral concern. They're usually not oh, thinking, oh gosh, I really want to understand the inelasticity of supply. They're thinking about, well, how is wealth created? How is poverty reduced? Well, and unfortunately, economics has been into a cul -de -sac, driven into a cul-de-sac mm. of, of mathematical yes. models. Yeah, and that's the problem. There's a lot of physics in, in economics, and so you treat the discipline as if it can't be scientific or rational unless we treat everything as if it's physics. But economists are studying human beings. We're studying groups of human beings and the way we buy and sell and exchange goods and services and information, how we act, right? And so we want an economic science that's appropriate to the object of study. And economists shouldn't think or pretend that they're studying atoms and molecules. They're studying people. And so you, if you're not talking about people and what we do and what we want and mm -hmm. what we can create, uh, it's unlikely you're talking about the main subject of what economics ought to be about. Is Are people rethinking the teaching of economics or are people getting at what you're, because, the, we, we, you know, I, I, most people think it's something that's uh, not for them. And you're no, absolutely. It, we ought to come back to the original idea that it, it was called political economy. It was. Political economy. I mean, Adam Smith was a moral philosopher. He yeah. wasn't even a political economist, unfortunately. Well, so are you. We, oh, absolutely. No, I'm a <laughs> shameless generalist. But I, I think all of these things are interesting. I think we need to just understand what exactly it is we're doing. I'm not saying math is bad. I'm not saying that economic models are bad. I'm saying they get at just a small sliver of the reality, and very often they capture the least interesting aspects of economic reality. Great. Jay, thank you. Great to be with you, Bill. Great fun talking, and hope you enjoyed this segment. And uh, we've got a bonus uh, uh, tip on, on fasting, and uh, I'm going to look into it. And so uh, enjoy. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for listening. Want more? Be sure to subscribe at thebillwaltonshow.com or on iTunes.